missile strikes, paratroopers, and lines of tanks. We are on the ground in Ukraine as Russia attacks. It's shortly after 7 in the morning here in Kiev, and there are air raid sirens going off across the city. Russia began its war on Ukraine. For weeks, Western intelligence agencies predicted that it might happen. But few, especially here in the capital Kiev, believed that it would. Plus, how do you take on the Russian military? Hint Hassan was in the trenches with Ukrainian soldiers, gearing up to fight a battle few think they can win. We're in eastern Ukraine with government forces who are preparing for the possibility of a Russian offensive. We're very, very close to the front lines with the Russian-backed separatists who are on the other side. And in Moscow, police arrested hundreds at an anti-war protest. American journalists! American journalists! Our reporter, Alec Loon, was one of them. This is a special edition of Vice News Tonight, Invasion of Ukraine. This is a special edition of Vice News Tonight. I'm Josh Hirsch. Russia has invaded Ukraine. It's a scary moment for the world, but our reporters have been covering this conflict since it started, and they're here to break down the war's latest chapter. We'll hear from Ukrainian soldiers at the border, families scrambling for safety, and what's left of the Russian opposition. We start in Kyiv with Matthew Castle. He's watched people pour out of the city as the first missiles hit. Matthew, what's it like on the streets of Kyiv? Josh, it's hard to explain just how much the situation here has changed in the past 48 hours. At this time on Wednesday night, the streets were full of people. Restaurants and bars were packed. People were shopping, coming home from work, going about their business as if everything was normal. Tonight, the situation couldn't be any more different. Almost everything, all the shops here are closed. There's almost nobody in the street apart from some security forces and some medics. And the air raid sirens in Kiev are nearly constant as the Russian forces get closer to the Ukrainian capital. Yesterday, after the war began, we visited a bus and train station here in Kiev where thousands of people were all frantically trying to get out of the city. We met one elderly woman there, Lena. She was in her 70s. She said that she had heard the news of the Russian invasion, but that she had gotten no information about what she was to do from the government. So she was in a bit of a panic about what she should do next. Are you worried for what's going to happen next? Люди не в силах остановити оцього Путіна, да? Даже допустим. Як його остановити зараз? Дивіться, всі страни, да, хотіли это. Їздили, хотіли найти якийсь компроміс, щоб не нападав на Україну, да? От. Але ж він жадно йому не дає остановитися і злоба. От, що я можу думати? От. Ну що? Этим миром правит сатана дьявол. От. But not everyone has the means to leave the city, or maybe they don't want to leave the city. Kiev happens to have the deepest metro stations in the entire world, and we visited one such metro station last night where there were hundreds of people who were seeking shelter from the war above ground. In that subway station, we met Christina, a 27-year-old who was seeking shelter there with her family. She described how one day, everything was different. She was going about her life. She was happy. And the next moment, everything changed. And she was in tears because she didn't know what she should do next. 24 hours later, she remains in that subway station. You guys are capturing just incredible scenes from ordinary Ukrainians. What's Ukrainian President Zelensky saying about all of this? Well, President Zelensky has been under immense pressure, as you can imagine. Um, he's vowed to stay here in the capital, Kiev. Um, he's also said that Ukraine has been, quote, left alone by its Western allies. Um, he's offered to negotiate with Russia. Uh, an advisor to Zelensky even went as far as to say that Ukraine would be open to discussing neutralization, meaning they would promise to not ever join NATO. 
Uh, Ukraine's membership in NATO has been a main sticking point between Russia and the West. Ordinary Ukrainians, meanwhile, are all hoping that this war ends as quickly as possible. Matthew Castle, thank you very much and stay safe out there. Fighting between Russia and Ukraine started eight years ago, and Hind Hassan's been reporting on it ever since. We're going to hear from her in a second, but first we'll see her report from January, when she spoke with Ukrainians preparing for all-out war. Viktor Kucherenko was killed at the front line of the fighting between Ukraine and separatists backed by Russia. His remains were brought back here, to his village. The fighting started in 2014. Since then, over 14,000 people have been killed. When you hear about civilians or soldiers dying, it's usually just as a statistic, but being here at this funeral really hits home the grim reality of war, and that is that behind the numbers, there are people, families, and communities that are completely devastated. І командир сповістив, що ваш син загинув. Прийміть наші співчуття. Він загинув як герой. Втратити найріднішу людину на війні це страшенне горе. Чому наші діти повинні там помирати? Командир, пусть ускоряються тут, тут просвет. The front line in the Luhansk region is where Viktor Kucherenko served. We're being taken to the point where Victor was killed. We just had to uh, run here really quickly because we're very close to where the Russian separatists are. So this is a very dangerous point. Deputy Commander Timur Stutsky was on the front line the day Kucherenko was killed. Can you explain to people who don't understand what it's like to lose someone at war? In the whole, we understood that we were people of the army and we had to take it менш емоційно. Ну, для мене особисто ці втрати дуже тяжкі. Hind Hassan is on assignment in Nairobi and joins me now. Hind, you were in Ukraine weeks before the invasion. What was the feeling then as Russia was preparing to invade? Well, as you saw in that clip, we spent time with the family of one of the soldiers who had been killed in the weeks before Russia's all-out offensive. And even though the community was going through this heartbreak, they were very welcoming and they let us film at the funeral because, as Victor's mother told us, she believed that her son had died as a hero and she wanted the world to hear his story. Now, despite this, she was also very, very clear about one thing, and that is that she believed the death of her son and the death of the 14,000 others who'd been killed as a result of this ongoing conflict was a tragedy that could have been prevented by the international community. And as a result of that inaction that she talks about and that we've seen over the years, Europe is now facing another refugee crisis on its doorstep. But the reality is that we don't know how far Putin will take this war or when it will end. But what we do know is that we are witnessing a developing humanitarian crisis in real time. And so far, it appears as though the international community hasn't been able to stop it. So what is the international community doing? 
There has been condemnation from many different countries. Sanctions have been threatened. Some sanctions have already been imposed. But none of this has stopped bombs from falling on Ukraine. And in fact, the United Nations Security Council currently is being chaired by Russia. So this is a body which is tasked with maintaining security, international peace and international security, has Russia in a diplomatic role. And on top of that, there are five countries that have a veto power in the United Nations Security Council. That includes the United States, the United Kingdom, France, China, and Russia. So any resolutions that are put forward for the United Nations Security Council to consider that would call on Russia to stop this war would, would be and will be vetoed by Russia. And I think this war, along with some of the others that we've seen in recent years, for example, in Syria or in Yemen, really displays and exposes just how powerless the United Nations Security Council can be. Hintasan, thank you. На Украине сегодня происходит безумная война. Здесь бомбятся сейчас для того, чтобы избежать военных действий. Я стыжусь своего гражданства. Я думаю, что это все-таки вынужденная мера, необходимая. А по нас будет а санкции там как-то отражаться, естественно, плохо. Мы живем в санкциях уже много-много лет. Санкции укрепляют Россию. Да, будет плохо России, но я не думаю, что кому-то будет от этого хорошо. С этим человеком, с президентом Путиным, не будет будущего никогда. Владимир Путин has enjoyed a high approval rating among Russians. That's not particularly surprising. He controls state-run media and silences anyone who challenges his authority. But not everyone has been willing to stay silent. Alec Loon was in Moscow covering an anti-war protest when police detained him. The number of people here has been getting bigger and bigger. People are getting more and more agitated, but police are also getting more active. And every, every minute they're arresting more and more people, taking them to awaiting police vans. American journalists! American journalists! American journalists! American journalists! I spoke to him after his release. So, Alec, what's the response been like in Moscow? Well, people were shocked and surprised here as well. Protesters came out to the streets of Moscow and other cities today, small groups. They were mostly immediately arrested. We went down to cover those protests. We were also arrested, um, let out, luckily, but a lot of people were taken away to police stations. There is no speech here now without fear. And we spoke to some protesters about the shame and the fear that they're feeling. Чувствуете стыд? Нет, мы чувствуем, что нас обижают. Конечно же, не так, как сегодня обижают наших ближайших соседей и друзей, но нас тоже обижают, потому что нам не оставляют ни выбора, ни права голоса. Мне стыдно. Мне стыдно, что это происходит, потому что везде слышишь слова, что русские напали. Это не русские напали. Это придурочные, которые там сидят, решают за нас. Мы это не хотим. Нам это не нужно. Россия и Украина вместе. So you got a chance to hear from protesters and people in the opposition, but how representative are they of the entire Russian population? How, how are Russians, what have they been told about this war? A recent poll found that three-fourths of Russia blame the U.S., NATO, or Ukraine for the tensions in Ukraine. And I don't think that's changed much given the state television coverage of this conflict. This is being presented not as a Russian invasion, but as a Russian response to quote-unquote aggression by Ukraine. The Russian foreign ministry is saying that this is not a war, um, this is Russia preventing a global war. So it's a very different view of the situation here, a very distorted view of the situation, and that's also pretty scary. What do you think Putin wants out of this? Is there anything that European leaders or American leaders could do to, to deter him? 
I think Putin is a little afraid of the sanctions that are coming down on Russia. He held a special meeting with the oligarchs, asking them to understand his response, asking them to help the government in uh, what would be tough times ahead with the sanctions. At the same time, this is a leader who no longer has any checks or balances. We saw him meeting with his top security officials, um, and everyone in the room was terrified, afraid to say that they thought this was a bad idea to invade Ukraine. This is a man who, who has been very isolated. We see him meeting with world leaders at the other end of a 60-foot-long table. Uh, and I think all that's really created this vision in Putin's mind of what he wants to get being, A, to uh, take Ukraine off of its pro-Western course, and B, to make Russia feared in the world, especially by NATO and the U.S. I think he uh, is looking to be remembered as the leader who brought Ukraine back into Russia's orbit. And it's very uncertain at this point because it looks like there's no one who can tell him any differently. That's a scary thought, Alec. Thank you very much for all of your work. Ми не можемо нормально поспати, ми прокидаємось від вибухів. Вместе з друзями сейчас в убежище, і непонятно, скільки це продлиться, непонятно чого. Те, що зараз найбільше лякає, це саме ця невизначеність, яка... Коли приходить війна, коли вона приходить в твій дом, ти перестаєш мислити категоріями днів, тиждень і місяців. В повітрі ти не знаєш, що станеться з тобою завтра, післязавтра. Президент Байден. Благаю, кожен українець, напевно, вас благає в тому, щоб ви прийняли якісь рішучі дії проти російської агресії, проти Росії. І Україна, якщо, не дай Бог, що то случиться, Україна точно не буде останнім рубежом. When Russian President Vladimir Putin announced the offensive, he warned the US and its NATO allies that interfering will, quote, lead you to consequences that you have never faced in your history. Liz Lander spoke with a Russian dissident who met with the Biden administration this week. He explains what the attacks mean for Russians and how this invasion could be part of Putin's broader strategy to expand his sphere of influence. Vladimir Ashurkov runs the Anti-Corruption Foundation, which was started by his colleague and Russian opposition leader, Alexei Navalny. Even Ashurkov didn't think Putin would go this far. Do you think that this could be a success for Putin? And what does that mean for an opposition movement? Already, it's terrible for Russia. It's uh, it's horrendous. And uh, um, there will be both short-term consequences and long-term consequences for Russia and, uh, and for Putin. In terms of opposition, naturally, when a country is involved in external conflict, you can expect that there will be further crackdown on independent voices in Russia, on media, on activists, etc. Unfortunately, that's the situation that we'll have to deal with. Do you think there could be a political cost for Putin? Inevitably, both in terms of sanctions and the countermeasures from the West. The war in Ukraine is not going to be a walk in the park. The Ukrainians have shown great resolve in defending their countries, even though militarily the balance is very largely skewed in favor of Russia. And it's not popular uh, war within Russia with the white population. They will see their standards of living deteriorate. Uh, they will see more repression against civil freedoms. Unfortunately, they will see coffins with the soldiers returning from the battlefields. What are your recommendations to the Biden administration right now? There, there are short-term um, actions, such as sanctions, but there has to be also a long-term strategy. This conflict is going to stay with us for quite some time. More broadly, the West has been functioning in cooperation, coexistence with autocratic regimes like Russians. I mean, if Russia was a democratic country, this wouldn't have happened. There is no appetite for bloodshed and uh, expansion uh, in Russia. So only since Putin is not controlled by any checks and balances within the country, he's able to do it. So I think there will be a big reconsideration of foreign policy in the US. Can it really coexist with uh, authoritarian regimes where crazy people like Putin can come to power?
Explain to me how the U.S. can target these kinds of people in a way that makes Putin and some of his top aides and cronies actually feel economic pain. There is no silver bullet that will make Putin change his behavior and that will bring Russia to the normal development path and to democratic values. Uh, but sanctions are important in that they serve as a punishment against those that are involved in corruption and human rights abuse. And also they serve as deterrent, maybe not so much to Putin, but to the political and economic elite of Russia that is enabling this uh, state and this uh, aggressiveness. Do you see this move in Ukraine as tied to a potential legacy that he is trying to leave behind? You know, when people are in power for so long, they get out of touch with reality. So yes, he has the vision of grandeur of himself, uh, of Russian Empire, uh, and uh, I think that's uh, that's what's driving uh, this new escalation. Russian Empire as opposed to reuniting the Soviet Union? He will take as much ground, as much turf as, as he can. Um, just over the last few months, we've seen Russian troops in Belarus, in Kazakhstan. I hope it doesn't come to this, but the Baltic states, which used to be part of the Soviet Union, may be on his horizon as well. And they are NATO members, and the NATO resolve uh, remains to be tested and seen. I think what I'm hearing from you is you think that this Ukrainian invasion could open the door to Putin trying to retake other countries? Listen, this tragedy that is happening now, it's a challenge for the US, it's a challenge for all democratic worlds, it's not going to be the last challenge of this sort. So um, brace yourself for more, unfortunately. That's it for now. Make sure to check out vicenews.com and follow our socials for continuing coverage.